Hi everyone, it's Lauren. I hope you're all doing really well. Today I'm going to be reviewing all of the books that I read in the month of July. And I read a lot of books in July because I was trying to do a read 30 books in 30 days or 31 days uh, challenge, which obviously I did not do, but I did end up reading 17 books. Um, so you can watch my vlogs for, for this challenge if you haven't seen them already. Um, but today we're just going to be reviewing them, just talking about the books. You'll be pleased to know that I actually included three of the books I read right at the beginning of July in my previous wrap up um, in June. So we only have 14 books to go through today because there's so many, they're just in a kind of pile of ease of ease <laughs> next to me. So this is not the order I read them in, but Hey, we like some randomness sometimes. So the first one I have here is Daphnis and Chloe by Longus, which um, is a Greek myth. And this book was given to me by Jean like years ago and I just haven't read it, I don't know why. Classic me. Um, but this is a really, oh my God, the books were already falling. This is a really nice pastoral myth um, about Daphnis and Chloe who are both found abandoned separately. Um, one being suckled by a goat, the other being suckled by a sheep. And then as they grow up, Daphnis is a goat herd, Chloe is a shepherdess. They let their goats and sheep um, graze together. They fall in love, but they don't know what love is, um, bless them. So they're trying to work out what they need to do and an old man in one of the stories an old man tells them they have to lie down naked together so they go oh okay and just lie down naked and they're like right what now <laughs> um so it's about them understanding about about love and then also the trials and tribulations that come to the community there are pirates um there are wars it's just really nice i don't read uh, mythology or ancient texts very often and this was really well translated so like easy to read and just quite sweet and quite funny. Next we have Girl with a Pearl Earring by Tracy Chevalier and to be honest I was really disappointed in this book. I think just because it's so famous I was expecting to completely fall in love with it. Um, I haven't been put off uh, Tracy Chevalier's writing in altogether. I will certainly try some of her more recent stuff because I know things like A Single Thread um, which comes to mind is a book that lots of people have really liked but I just I really wanted to love this more. This is an imagined story of the girl who was painted by Vermeer in this portrait and so we follow Greet who is forced to go into to become a servant for Vermeer and their family um, when her father loses his sight and can't work anymore and it's just about her life really, her going to their house, meeting all the children, what it's like for her in that house and how her relationship with Vermeer develops um, and leading up to the painting of this portrait. Um, but I think what I, what I struggled with is that Greet has n so little agency, which is understandable because she's a young uh, teenage girl, like she has to work, she's poor, like, lots of people have power over her and she doesn't have very much power in this society but I also felt like I didn't know her as a character I didn't really know what she what she wanted um so like her family just say you have to go and be a servant now so she goes and becomes a servant um some of the little girls are quite mean to her in the house and bully her which I find really difficult I was like why don't you just say what's going on and the other servant is a bit jealous of her then there's all issues with the wife, Vermeer's wife and her mother in the house and the way people treat her and are, are jealous of her or look down on her. So she's kind of completely powerless in the house. And then also when she goes to the meat market, there's the butcher's son who fancies her. And I don't know if she fancies him. I really don't understand. He's like, yeah, I want to marry you. And she's like, oh, okay. I just feel like everything was happening to her which is fine if that is the if that is what is happening in the society and she doesn't have any power but i didn't know how she felt about it um and i think you're, it's supposed to be implied that she's falling in love with vermeer and or he's falling in love with her but again i didn't i didn't quite i didn't quite get that i didn't quite understand and i don't i just don't feel like the relationships and the emotions within greek were really really explored enough um for me to believe it i just didn't really believe she was in love with her mate and i certainly didn't believe she was in love with uh, i think it's called peter but i will say it might just be how i felt like i felt sorry for greet and i felt frustrated by all these characters 
you know, that doesn't necessarily mean the book is bad, that means it's good in a way, because I'm, I'm finding all these characters so frustrating and I'm finding her situation so frustrating. But it was just to a point where I was like, I am annoyed. <laughs> so, so I just couldn't enjoy it. Next we have If I Had Your Face by Frances Shaw, which is lent to me by my friend Kate. And this is a series of stories, but they are linked, it's not really short stories, um, of different women um, in, in Korea. A lot of them are very young women, um, some of them are married and several of them are from very impoverished backgrounds and it's a look at Korean society, very much a look at class um, and the position of women and the general sexual mores of Korean society where it's very accepted and expected that men will go to room salons and visit prostitutes and, and young girls after work but women are expected to be extremely dutiful daughters and mothers and not be very sexual but at the same time there's a huge pressure to have um, plastic surgery and to look a certain way so this is kind of looking at these these young girls girls and young women who are caught up within all these different different pools within society i didn't know very much going in about korean society so it's very interesting to see all of those different um different issues that they're dealing with and yeah i think i didn't I, it was just fine. It was interesting. I liked the characters um, and it read very easily and very well, but I don't think it blew me away as such. Next we have a play, which is The Seer by Ali Smith. And this is very interesting. This is a very meta play about a, a Scottish couple who are just living a very ordinary, boring life. They never go anywhere. They just argue about nothing and that's, that's their life. And then this woman just walks into their flat one day and says that she's um, the woman Iona's sister. And she's like, oh, hi, I'm your sister Kirsty and because Iona is so bored she's just like yes it's my sister here she is and she just goes with it and nobody knows who this woman actually is but then it becomes even more self-aware when Kirsty suddenly can see the audience and she's like who are those people out there and like audience members come up on stage like it gets incredibly meta and it's just very funny. I think because Ali Smith is an author you can really really see that in this play um, like her stage directions, like everything about the description of the set, everything about what the characters are doing is so specific. And um, that makes it really easy to read because you really understand what these characters are doing. Not all plays when you read them are like that, um, which I think is quite funny because if you're directing this play, she doesn't give you very much creative license. You have to kind of do, you know, she's telling you what her intent is all the way through the play. Um, so I think this is really fun to read and also I can I can see it being performed really well on stage um, as well because this very calm, normal uh, life that these uh, this couple have just descends into utter chaos and they start to question like the very reality of themselves and what what's going on. It's just, I mean, I don't really know that there's a conclusion. I don't really know where it's going, but it's just a fun ride. On my Kindle I read Finding Joy by Adriana Herrera which is a romance novel of two men in, set in Ethiopia. So we follow Dester who is American and he's in Ethiopia um, to work for a pro on a project for, for a few months and there he meets Elias who is a local man working with um, Age USA and he's his driver like driving him around and they fall in love and this was just lovely. It was a very nice kind of romance where there was lots there was enough angst, which is what you need in a romance novel, um, but mainly that came out of the fact that being gay is illegal in Ethiopia and Elias like wasn't out to his family and the fact that Desta's only there for a few weeks. So it's a bit like a holiday romance. He was like, well, where is this going? Like, I can't ask you to throw everything away, away from me when I'm going to go back to the US in a few months time. Um, but they were both like really nice people. <laughs> that's, that's what I like. I don't like in romances where people treat each other badly or I don't know. It was just a nice level of misunderstanding and it made sense to me that they would develop very deep feelings because when you're on a project for six weeks or a few months or whatever, you get very, very close with the people that you're living and working with and it can be very intense and that, you know, I just felt like all of the the context and the environment was, was right for this kind of story um, to develop in a really believable way and it just be like a really nice fun read so I would recommend this, it's my first Adriana Herrera that I've read um, and I'd like to read some more of her things because I know she's written quite a lot of um, romances and a lot of like queer romances as well so if you have any that you'd like to recommend for me please do leave them in the comments below now we have a stonkingly good book, which was Mr. Loverman by Bernadine Evaristo. I really loved this, although it did 
affect me quite a lot. I think I came out of this book feeling quite sad for everyone involved, which I don't know if that was the intention of the book, um, but I, I did get very sucked in. This is about Barry, who is 74, and Tegan living in the UK for, for many, many years. He's been married to Carmel for over 50 years, and he is gay and has that entire time been in a relationship with his best friend Morris and just never told Carmel. So she's assumed he's been having affairs with women, like their whole marriage. She's very, very unha unhappy. And he's really unhappy in his own way because obviously with the time that he grew up in, like the age he is, and the fact that within the West Indian culture is very homophobic, um, he feels like he can't really be himself with Morris. And Morris is really sad because he's he did divorce his wife many years ago, but he's been living alone and can't live with Barry this whole time. And both of Barry and Carmel's daughters are quite damaged from this <laughs> very bad marriage that their parents have had. But it's extremely funny. Um, and the characters are so so three-dimensional, so well done. You mostly hear from Barry's perspective, but you do get chapters from Carmel's as well. And there's just so much empathy for both of these characters here. They are both, well, everyone, to be fair, not just them two, deeply flawed. Um, and you understand why they're rubbing people up the wrong way. And you don't agree with a lot of their choices necessarily, but you understand their choices. And it's a really great read. I was fully laughing out loud when Barry was describing some of Carmel's friends from church, like the way he was interjecting in his in his head. And I think this would be really wonderful, especially if you enjoy like very character driven books. The book I read most recently actually, but which is next in my pile, is The Book You Wish Your Parents Had Read by Philippa Perry. And I saw this on Sophie's channel, um, Portal in the Pages, quite a long while ago now. Um, and I thought this would be very interesting because I really find child development fascinating, like the way they learn and grow. And I do read things about that um, periodically. And obviously me and Will do want to have children at some point. So I thought this would be a really good read. And it's very, it's very confrontational, I think, this book, depending on your personality. Um, it's really about you looking into yourself and it's about how we bring our own childhoods and our own emotions through into our parenting style. But I think this is re relevant, really, if you're going to relate to anyone. It's not necessarily just about parenting, um, but it's about showing empathy and understanding and building really good relationships with anyone, but especially in this book with your child. There aren't tips and tricks in this book. It isn't like Super Nanny. Um, it's much more of almost a personal therapy exercise. There's lots of case studies in here, lots of information from Philippa Perry, but also exercises for you to do and like the way for you to think about your own childhood and think about what your own emotional triggers are. Like, do you not like it when someone tells you something? That's me. I don't like it when people tell me things that I, that I already know. I really hate it, but why? Why do I? Why would I react like that? Um, and everyone's got their own little little things um, and their little triggers, and it's really about recognising that. A rather disappointing book for me next, unfortunately, and that was Permission by Saskia Vogel. This is about a young woman whose father has just died, and she develops a relationship with a woman across the road who is a dominatrix and it's her understanding that world. We also see um, Orly, her life as a dominatrix, all of her different clients, um, her submissive who lives with her, Piggy, and Echo gets more and more involved in Orly and Piggy's life and in, in this society. Um, but I just don't know why. I think at the end of the book, I was like, what is this saying? I think it's supposed to be a look at kind of permission, um, love, and pain and how all of those things you know are linked but I just I was I wasn't convinced that this is what Echo wanted I just got no sense of what she wanted the whole way through the book um, and I did get the sense that she was quite lost and didn't really know what she what she wanted but I don't know I just feel like this was trying to deal with some themes but it didn't actually end up saying anything at the end of the day I just was like why though like you've not why this is just people doing stuff and that I don't, and in sharp contrast to that book, I also read The First Bad Man by Miranda July, which deals with very similar issues in like a profoundly better way. Um, I thought this was really well written and I really, I really enjoyed it. This is about Cheryl who has deep, deep social anxieties. She really overthinks everything, um, which I think if you've either read Miranda July's short stories or you've seen some of her movies, you would, you'll recognise this that comes out in a lot of her characters. 
almost to the level of absurdity um, and comedy but she's she's living by herself she has very strict routines to help her deal with life she's also obsessed with an older man um, who is on the board at her company and she's in love with him and trying to find ways for them to meet really really overthinking the every interaction they have and then her other bosses at work ask her if they're um, young daughter can go and stay with them for a, a few weeks so she comes to stay with Cheryl she's incredibly rude it's a very difficult relationship and then their relationship goes through twists and turns which like are go through the bizarre at, at first they start fighting then they start play acting fighting and the whole book is really looking at Cheryl's difficulty with boundaries not knowing where the boundaries are in any of her relationships either sexual or friendly familial whatever they are she just doesn't understand where those lines are really and she really struggles with that and then creating this safe space where they have this these this almost defined set of rules for them to interact is very freeing for her um and i mean that's the best way i can describe it it, it goes on twists and turns in terms of plot um but it is very funny in, in places and very in cheryl is a very endearing character she did remind me of Eleanor in Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. It's very similar to that, but like vastly superior. I've also been listening to an audiobook throughout the month, and that is Isabella She Wolf of France by Alison Weir. And this is more history than biography. To be honest, I chose it because I thought it would be quite focused on Isabella and, and give me an idea of her character. What it turned out to be is much more a list of events and, and dates and looking at Isabella and her marriage and the reign of Edward II, the reign of Edward III and just about everything that happened um, in that period. I don't think this worked very well as an audiobook and I wouldn't recommend it um, just because of the way it's edited as an audiobook and the fact that it's so many lists of facts and people that I, I find it very difficult to follow. But once I got about halfway through the book and we got into the meat of Isabella's life and what was happening during that time, I thought it was fascinating. I really loved it and I, I didn't really know very much about this, this part of history. Um, the fact that Edward II was for all intents and purposes gay or at least bi, um, had had various favourites throughout his, throughout his reign who then got very cocky and all the other lords were like we need to get rid of them like and then eventually he got overthrown by Isabella for um their son Edward III like there's just so much going on like I didn't realize there was a coup against the king and then there's this whole conspiracy as to whether he got murdered or whether he escaped and there's just so many interesting things it's literally like an episode of Game of Thrones I cannot believe it's real like even to one point where um his one of his favorites Hula Dispenser gets banished like the lords are like you need to get rid of him he's banished from England so he just goes to the channel and becomes a pirate like like you do when your lover spurns you go and become a pirate I just cannot believe I just, it's just so far-fetched and I loved it um I just think it was a shame how it was written there are so many facts in there which were completely unnecessary like how much she's spending on stockings per month like I did not need that information and I wish Alison Weir had perhaps done some more interpretation of the facts rather than just giving them to me um and said which she does do later on in the book when she's talking about this conspiracy with Edward II and whether he escaped to France or not um like that's really her telling me a story and that's what I wanted so it was a bit Com see comes up for me. I was really pleased that I finished it though because I found the actual history really interesting. I also read The Lonely Londoners by Sam Selvin, which um, is a contemporary novel about the Windrush generation um, coming into London. And I thought this was great. I, it really made me wish I'd studied it at school because that's how it that's how it felt the way it was written I feel like I could have written an essay on its structure this is more like a series of vignettes of different characters coming to London but Moses is someone who's been in London for a long time and when new guys are fresh off the boat um, he tends to come and meet them and it really feels like Moses is treating you the reader as somebody who's new to London and he's introducing you to this Caribbean community and um, telling you what it's like for everyone what their society is like in London how different it is for them to get work, the racism they deal with and then by the end of it you've kind of collected a group of lots of different men and they become this this group right at the end and you really see this community and although this does feel really real it also kind of reminded me the way it was written of Catch-22 the way each character is sort of introduced separately and you see a little bit of their life and 
you learn more and more about their character traits and their foibles and it becomes a little bit abstract in places um, but then you see later on in the book how they're all linked. Um, I just enjoyed it and the main thought I had while I was reading it is I should have studied this in school and I wish I had studied this in school because it's much more relevant to the UK um, and London than a lot of the other books we studied which are really similar to this like I was thinking of like Of Mice and Men and I was like okay fine nothing against John Steinbeck but why didn't I study like this is so much more relevant to a student in, in the UK um, so that's going to be my campaign now. This should be on the school curriculum. I also read an advanced copy of Summer Water by Sarah Moss, which I downloaded onto my Kindle. And I absolutely loved this book. This is a companion novella to Ghost Wall, which she released a couple of years ago. Um, and at first I couldn't really see how they were linked. And they're not really. But now that I read both of them, I can really see the similarities and why they go together. This is about a group of people who are in Scotland at a holiday camp and it's just raining torrentially. Um, they're in these log cabins, which are by a lock, and there's nothing for any of these families to do other than sit in their cabin or get wet. And we go to each of these different characters in their cabins, what they think of their holiday, what they think of all the other residents in the holiday camp. Um, and it's very, it's very interesting the way that develops and it builds to disaster in the w same way that Ghost Wall does. It feels very, very normal and very British and just these families and all kind of bickering with each other. Um, but then there's this Ukrainian family who are being quite loud and everyone's like, oh, they're being loud, they're ruining it for everyone else. And it kind of builds and builds um, a little bit, at first, a little bit bizarrely and then more towards disaster. But I always think Sarah Moss writes families incredibly well, incredibly intuitively, and she's really good at getting into the heads of mothers, fathers and children and you really understand their dynamics. So I think if you like the rest of her work you will love this because it's just this exceptional uh, character um, character driven voice coming through. I also read Public Library by Ali Smith which is short stories interspersed with um, comments from authors or just general people about what libraries mean to them and this was okay. I think I prefer Ali Smith writing long form than I do short stories and I couldn't really see how these stories were linked to libraries. They were very different although there was an overriding theme of research and learning about other other things. There's a lot of stories in here about Catherine Mansfield and just about poetry in general um, and about people talking about facts. So I, I guess there's a link there to what libraries are for and what they mean to people, but there's no stories that are like about a library. And yeah, it was fine because I like Ali Smith's writing um, and I enjoyed some of the stories, but it wasn't particularly blown away by it. But I tell you what I was blown away by, and that was my last book I have for you in this video, which is Greek Myths by Jean Mingus. And this is a beautiful children's book telling you about the Greek myths, um, written by Jean. And so, of course, it is wonderful. I mean, I might be biased, but I think, I think not. I think this is just wonderful. It's really beautifully illustrated, and I know that when I was younger, I would have loved this. The, the Greek myths are really age appropriately rendered with and but they're still kind of true to the myths themselves um there's icarus flying there it's really really beautiful um and there's also introductions to the gods and goddesses specifically um what they do what represents them um i had a book on ancient myths when i was younger and all stuff about like, the greek underworld and everything like that and i used to pour over it again and again because i just thought it was so fascinating this complete world that the greeks had created and i think this would really tap into that and i think it's a great introduction i think younger children can have the stories read to them older children can read this themselves and i like that it doesn't it, it doesn't talk down to them in any way uh so i mean i loved reading it and i'm 31 so that was my July. I would love to hear from you if you've read any of these books. Let me know what you thought of them. Let me know what you've been reading in July as well. And I will see you in my next video. Bye.